Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be talking about the pentose phosphate pathway. I noticed there aren't many YouTube videos on this topic, and I, so, so I decided to make this video to mainly help you guys and myself understand this topic better. Having said that, however, I'm not an expert on this topic, and I hope you guys correct me if I make any mistakes. Let's get started. The pentose phosphate pathway. So the pentose phosphate pathway is just another route glucose 6-phosphate can go to besides glycolysis and glycogen synthesis. And this pathway produces two key important molecules, and those are ribose 5-phosphate and NADPH. Not NADH, but NADPH. Again, the pentose phosphate pathway produces two important molecules, ribose 5-phosphate and NADPH. This is just an overview slide. So the pentose phosphate pathway has two branches. First, there's the oxidative branch. And all these, all these reactions are going to be non-reversible. So this box here, it shows the oxidative branch. And these enzymes require magnesium 2 plus, And all these reactions are going to be non-reversible. So glucose 6-phosphate is going to come in from glucose, obviously, and then it's going to become 6-phosphoglucolactone, okay? And then 6-phosphoglucolactone is going to become 6-phosphogluconate. And then 6-phosphogluconate is going to become ribulose 5-phosphate, okay? I'm going to go into these reactions in a greater depth now, and that way I think you guys will get a better understanding of where everything is coming from, and just some tips and tricks to remember all of them, okay? started. So reaction one, what's going to happen first is glucose 6-phosphate, it's going to come in and with the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, we're going to make 6-phosphoglucolactone, abbreviated as 6-PGL, okay? So glucose 6-phosphate with the enzyme 6, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, we're going to make 6-PGL. Look look at essentially what's happening. All that's happening is that this carbon over here, carbon one of the of, gluco, of the glucose sugar, it's becoming into a carbonyl group, okay? Mainly in this, this makes this an ester, okay? So this has big implications. We have created an ester, molecule, ester bond right here, okay? So it's going to have a big impact on the extraction. Notice that we have used NADP plus to generate one NADPH, okay? Now, Let's go to reaction two. We have 6-phosphoglucolactone, and this 6-phosphoglucolactone is, is going to undergo extra hydrolysis at this, at this position over here with water, and we're going to be creating 6-phosphogluconate, okay? So what's, essentially what's happening is that, again, also essentially what's happening is that 6-phosphogluconate is undergoing extra hydrolysis to make 6-phosphogluconate using the enzyme glucolactonase, okay? So this enzyme has another name we've seen here, 6-phosphogluconate lactonase, but I like to call it its short name, glucolactonase, okay? It's easier to remember, in my opinion, okay? So reaction three, 6-phosphogluconate, what can happen is that we're going to take the enzyme 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase and we're going to create ribulose 5-phosphate. Again, we're using NADP plus to generate an NADPH, okay? So what's essentially happening in this reaction? First, we're gonna take this carbon, right, and we're gonna oxidize it. We're gonna we're gonna make it a C C double O group, okay? And if you remember from organic chemistry, if you have a carboxylic acid group next to a ketone group, ketone group like this, what can happen is that we can have decarboxylation essentially, and so this this position right, here, this bond right here, it's gonna be chopped off, and we're gonna be left with really ribulose 5-phosphate here, okay? Again, so we have 6-phosphogluconate, and that's going to become rib that's gonna become ribulose 5-phosphate using the enzyme 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase, okay? Let's talk about the non-oxidative branch now, since we have completed making ribulose 5-phosphate. At this step, ribulose 5-phosphate can undergo in two directions. And remember, these reactions are all going to be reversible. The reactions previously were all non-reversible, but the reactions now are going to all become reversible in the non-oxidative branch. Okay, so ribulose 5-phosphate can go in, can go in two directions. 
we can have ribulose 5-phosphate isomerase making ribose 5-phosphate, and this is just an aldose ketose transformation, or ribulose 5-phosphate can make xylulose 5-phosphate using ribulose 5-phosphate epimerase, and the epimerase at carbon number 3. Recall that epimers are just, are just sugars that, that differ in the position of one OH group, okay? Next, we're going to have ribose 5-phosphate, and with the enzyme xylulose 5-phosphate, we're going to create cytoheptylose. And with the enzyme transcutylase, we're going to create cytoheptylose 7-phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate. And the enzyme that's going to be doing this is called transcutylase, okay? So one trick to remembering the number of carbons in these molecules is just looking at the carbon at which phosphate is attached. Coincidentally, the length of the carbon, like the sugar, is where the phosphate is attached. So you can use that to your advantage. Okay, so 5 plus 5 is 10 on this side, and 7 plus 3 is 10 on this side. So we're not losing any carbons in these reactions, okay? So again, ribose 5-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate with the enzyme transcutylase creates cytohepulose 7-phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate. Next, okay, oh yeah, another thing I forgot to mention is the cofactor of this reaction is going to be thiamine pyrophosphate, abbreviated as TPP. Okay, so cytohepulose 7-phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate can undergo another reaction, and these two together will create erythrose 4-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. Okay. So 7 plus 3 is 10, 4 plus 6 is 10. Again, we have the same amount of carbons on both sides, okay? And this this um, this reaction involves a shift base intermediate. I'm not going to go into more, more detail. Into, I'm not going to go into more detail with that, but I think that's a good thing to remember. Okay? So again, sodium phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate are going to generate erythrose 4-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate with the enzyme transaldolase. Okay, so first enzyme was transketolase and then transaldolase. Next, erythrose 4-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate, these two metabolites, okay, I know these two reactions are horizontal, but now I'm going to go vertically, okay. So erythrose 4-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate, these two together can make fructose 6-phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay, and the enzyme that does this again is transkyrylase. Notice that transkyrylase has group specificity. Okay, it can it can either use erythrose 4-phosphate or ribose 5-phosphate. And notice notice the similarity between these molecules too as well, right? So all the OHs are pointing to the right. Okay, look, there's an R here and there's an R here. To me, that signifies that everything's pointing to the right. That's how I remember it. It might help you guys, I guess. Okay, so erythrose 4-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate with the enzyme transkylase, we're going to be creating fructose 6-phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate. Again, we have TPP as a cofactor. Okay. So another thing that you should notice is that fructose 6-phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate are just uh, metabolites from glycolysis. And so the pentose phosphate pathway and glycolysis are linked together. And these molecules can interchange from one reaction, from one pathway to the other, if they wanted to. Okay, and that's going to have big implications, and I'm going to get to that in the next two slides, next few slides. So let's review the non-oxidative branch. The reaction, if you think about it, well, what it really is is two xylulose 5-phosphates and one ribose 5-phosphate is making two fructose 6-phosphate and one grisaldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay. And like I said earlier, again, these two metabolites are linked to glycolysis. All right, so the pentose 5-phosphate metabolites, they're going to depend on the energy state of a cell and the cell types, different cell types, okay? Suppose a cell needs a lot of NADPH, such as fat cells, and what they're going to be mainly using the, from the pentose, pentose phosphate pathway is going to be the oxidative branch. And what's going to happen is that ribulose 5 and what's going to happen with all those ribulose 5-phosphate metabolites that are created is that they're going to go towards glycolysis via fructose 6-phosphate and grisaldehyde 3-phosphate, okay? 
However, suppose that a cell needs a lot of ribose 5-phosphate. So these are going to be like growing cells and they're going to be using ribose 5-phosphate in nucleotide synthesis, okay? And these are going to be mainly using the non-oxidative path. What's going to happen is that using the non-oxidative branch, we're going to we're going to take fructose we're going to take fructose 6-phosphate and glycosylide 3-phosphate and we're going to go backwards to create ribose 5-phosphate, okay? And so these, they're going to be using the pentose phosphate pathway to generate ribose 5-phosphate, and they're going to be coming from glycolysis, all right? So that's pretty much all I had to say about the pentose phosphate pathway. I hope this video was helping, helpful and helped to learn this topic. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Goodbye.